Saturn's most remarkable feature are the rings. But why are there rings and not moons or so? To answer this, we will create a small Python script in this session. Hey everybody, it's nice to see you all back. Thomas here from my channel Astronize and today we are having a small video here in my series Compressed Cosmos. New ideas for new Compressed Cosmos series and also new ideas for the Universe Sandbox and this video is something I would like to combine with the Universe Sandbox series. Now as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, the question, the rhetorical question, why does Saturn have rings? Let's take a look, for example, at this particular picture. This is a picture where the sun is on the other side of Saturn and you see here the remarkable nice moons, but also this bluish colored donut shape, which is the so-called earring, which consists of ice particles uh, from the moon and Celadus and his cryovolcanic activities. But the question is now, the larger ring that consists of large particles, larger boulders and rocks and also meteoroids um, that form the ring. Why is the ring there and why it's, is it not a single moon or two moons or something like that? To answer this, we are going to talk today about something called tidal forces. And to talk about tidal forces, we have to go into my Python repository yeah, or my GitHub repository, the Astronize YouTube tutorials. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can now use the issues tab to create new ideas for the Compressed Cosmos series or larger projects as you like. But today we are having this Compressed Cosmos session about the tidal forces and we simply open the script and we click here on open in Colab. And then if you have a Google account, it easily opens up this script in Google Colab. Let's connect to some computer instance and talk a little bit about tidal forces. Now, if we have a large, um, a large planet like the Earth or Jupiter or something like that, and a smaller moon, then the moon or the object cannot revolve in any particular or any um, constellation around the planet. The thing is that, especially if we have certain orbital properties, the so-called tidal forces or the tidal stress on the moon is so high that the moon heats up yeah or even worse it can break apart and to compute this there are some of course some yeah some larger equations where you can derive all the all the formula for two distinct cases the case number one is for a object that is let's say solid that is not deformable yeah pretty unrealistic because also yeah, mostly we don't have, uh, even though one thinks the moon is very, very rigid or also uh, the earth, of course, they have a certain elasticity and especially comets or asteroids, they are not a single iron ball or so, but they consist of several smaller pieces that are, let's say, more fluid, so to speak, yeah, more deformable. So they are like two these two equations. And here we have one equation, one of that has been derived from all this computational process is the so-called critical distance. The critical distance between a planet and its moon and a distance that will lead to um, a violent disruption of this moon. And the equation is pretty simple. Um, it's basically yeah, some constant factor times the radius of the planet times the density of the planet divided by the density of the moon. So what we see here in the equation is that the radius of the moon doesn't matter really. Uh, it's, it's just the radius of the planet and the corresponding densities. Now with this equation we can simply create a Python function here in our very first cell. Of course, yeah, um, I trust my own uh, notebook, so let's execute the script. And then we can compute the critical um, distance for our Earth and our Moon. And our mo Earth has a radius of um, 6,300 kilometers times 1,000 to convert to meters. 
and the densities are around 5,500 kilogram per cubic square meter and for the moon is around 3.3 tons. So these are like average values of course the density varies depending whether you're in the core or the mantle or so but yeah it's the average value and we can simply put it into our functions compute it and then compute the radius not the radius but the critical um, distance between moon and earth for our system and this is like around 19,000 kilometers so this is pretty far away considering that our um moon is 300,000 kilometers away and its radius is well, almost 2,000 kilometers so even not with the radius considering the radius it reaches this uh, distance um, you may ask though wait the international space station and other things they are also orbiting why are not they breaking apart well these tidal forces they apply best to objects that are held together by a gravitational pull so like a moon for example the main force that holds the moon together is the gravity it's it, it is 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 its own gravity the same thing applies also to larger asteroids or comets like the one remarkable comet as i show you here in this picture is shoemaker levy 9 that was being um, pulled by jupiter and then at some point it violently disrupt, yeah, disrupted, was destroyed, fragmented into pieces that then crashed into the planet. But back to our case, again, something like the space station, also very small objects, the main reason why they are held together are of course other, let's say, adhesive forces and not gravity. So it's not the gravity that holds the International Space Station together. Um, it is more uh, other forces let's say now we can do the same thing now for saturn yeah for saturn we have a very large radius of around 60,000 kilometers and the density is pretty low so it's around 600 kilogram per cubic meter so it's even smaller than water so theoretically saturn could swim on uh, on the water and for Enceladus, we have 1.6 tons, so it's a very icy world with some stones, let's say, very, very easily. And for this, we can also compute now the critical uh, distance, and we can do it here in these cells. And there we get a, a distance of around 110,000 kilometers. Now, Enceladus is also a rather small moon, so it's also not, um, and also has a, has a semi-major axis of around 200,000 kilometers so it's far away from its destructive influence of Saturn but now the interesting thing is if we take a look back to our rings yeah and I took this image here from the our Wikipedia page maybe I should open this image in a new tab so we can increase it here we are then we see here the different rings also the different names and there we see a range of let's say between 75,000 kilometers and around 140,000 kilometers. So 110,000 kilometers would be somewhere here in between. And now considering that other objects in the Saturnian system may have the same density more or less, this is an area where destructive tidal forces play a major role. There are different theories where the rings come from. There's like um, the idea that there were two moons that collided to, uh, that were that collided and um, caused this fragments and uh, with more fragmentation the rings were formed or um, an asteroid was catched or a comet was catched this was then also violently destructed by tidal forces. All in all, one can say that a large moon with the density of Enceladus couldn't sh uh, couldn't shape and exist in um, in such a close proximity to Saturn. So this is a very likely scenario, one of the reasons, let's say, why no larger moon can form around this gas giant. So these are very easy and simple equations, but they imply a lot, like for example, the Saturn thingy. And I think um, this is also pretty interesting and also maybe a very nice short video for the Compressed Cosmos series. In our next video, we will also go more into extra galactical stuff in between 
you'll have a look at Universe Sandbox, how we can simulate this. And until then, stay curious and hopefully you're also looking forward to the next video. Until next time.